Hi, everybody. It is April 4, 2019. I want to read some of this article written by John Whitehead, the constitutional attorney. Many of you know John Whitehead. American idiocracy 50 years later, we're still stranded in the Twilight Zone. I never watched the Twilight Zone as a kid, and I might have seen a two-minute clip on YouTube. Still haven't watched it. And it's interesting to me because Oh, I look back and I never, ever liked fiction. I always gravitated towards nonfiction. I always wanted to see what was real. Little did I know, you know, some <clears throat> uh, five and a half decades later, that the fiction was actually nonfiction. It just hadn't happened yet. So, I also want to say that very often when I read articles or watch videos, I listen to people talk about the psychopathic quote-unquote elite, the politicians, the CEOs. They talk about their behaviors and it seems as if just ordinary people are not on the radar. So I need to bring it into focus. We have helped manifest this nightmare. We have all contributed. And I know that people get upset when I say that, but too bad. We have, and I have, and it was only when I started doing an awful lot of work on my own self, reevaluating those beliefs that I had, doing that self-reflection, examining my own behavior. Did I more and more stop contributing? And if we cannot take a look at ourselves, how we have also helped manifest this reality, we will continue to con contribute and help it along. So, we're developing a new citizenry, one that will be very selective about cereals and automobiles, but won't be able to think. Rod Serling. Isn't that true? Yes, it is very true. Have you noticed how much life increasingly feels like an episode of The Twilight Zone? Only instead of Rod Serling's imaginary land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas, we're trapped in a topsy-turvy, all-too-real land of corruption, brutality and lies, where freedom, justice, integrity play second fiddle to political ambition, corporate greed, and bureaucratic tyranny. And again, May I say, there's an awful lot of people who are not CEOs, ordinary people, greedy, selfish, ambitious, tyrannical, who lie, who are brutal and vicious, who are corrupt, who don't behave in a way that you could say that person has integrity. They talk a game and they don't live it. So it's not merely that life in the American police state is more brutal or more unjust or even more corrupt. Corrupt. It's getting more idiotic, more perverse, and more outlandish by the day. Excuse me. So People, ordinary people, idiotic, perverse, immoral, outlandish, brutal, mean, uncaring. We do have to change. That's the only way that we can ever manifest. Anything different. Somewhere over the course of the past 240 years, democracy has been way too 
idiocracy. And representative government has given way to uh, kleptocracy, a government ruled by thieves and a kistocracy, a government ruled by unprincipled career politicians, corporations, and thieves that panders to the worst vices in our nature and has little regard for the rights of American citizens. Examples abound. In Georgia, political organizers posted a black media only sign outside a Baptist church, barring white reporters from attending a meeting about an upcoming mayoral um, election. In Arizona, a SWAT team raided a family's home in the middle of the night on the say-so of Child Protective Services, which sounded the alarm after the parents determined that their two-year-old, who had been suffering a hundred degree fever, was feeling better and didn't need to be admitted to the hospital. In Virginia, Landlords are requiring dog-owning tenants to submit their pet's DNA in a database that will be used to track down and fine owners who fail to clean up after their dog's poop in public. In Texas, a police officer who allegedly gave a homeless man a sandwich. A police officer gave a homeless man a sandwich with dog feces won't be held accountable for his actions. In Illinois, Chicago police used a battering ram and a sledgehammer to crash into a family's home with weapons drawn, terrorizing the young children gathered for a four-year-old's birthday party, only to find that they were at the wrong house. In Kansas, a 61-year-old black man in the process of moving into his new home found himself held at gunpoint and handcuffed by police who refused to believe he was a homeowner and not a burglar. And there are countless stories every single day of how unbelievably crazy the world's people have become. But I focus on Americans because I am American. So, if you're starting to notice a pattern here, it speaks to the fact that nearly 50 years after Serling's creative brainchild, The Twilight Zone, premiered on national television, we're still fumbling around in the dark trying to make sense of a world dominated, dominated by racism, cruelty, war, violence, poverty, prejudice, intoler intolerance, ignorance, injustice, and a host of other social maladies and spiritual evils. Now, I posted a video last night, and the picture that you see in your feed with the videos was of Martin Luther King Jr., and on it I wrote, Since, since then, what have we accomplished? Nothing good because collectively we haven't uh, we haven't come together we haven't been a serious mature people taking responsibility for anything and we have just grown more and more self-centered yeah I know Many of you get upset when I say that. I'm sorry. Don't mean to upset you, but it is the truth. The Twilight Zone was an, was an oasis in television wasteland, a show that captured imaginations, challenged moral hypocrisy and societal prejudices and railed against inhumanity, racism, prejudice, the machinations of human beings by way of their technology, tyrants of all shapes and colors, a passive populace, war, injustice, the surveillance state, corporate greed. Fifty years later, with so much having changed legally, technolo uh, technologically, 
politically, so much still remains the same. Why? If we don't change, everything remains the same. But we allow a certain group of people to continue on spreading evil, destroying life for their own purposes, but we still stay the same. <clears throat> so they, it's like we've given them carte blanche, go for it, permission. Our silence equals consent. Kill me, please. Destroy me, please. Ah, you've made life so, uh, so hard. It's no longer uh, enjoyable. So now, because you've made it that way, now I just want to die. And so many people are, they want to die. They want out. And we're not recognizing our own individual power to change things. But yes, of course, you do need the individuals in the aggregate. We can't do this alone in our communities. We need to join forces. The American people just don't do that. Most just don't join together to try to make their own communities better. So this is what we, we get. We've got to begin to understand how our behavior, recognize the ripple effect of it. Prejudice is the same. Fear is the same. Ignorance is the same. Hate and war and tyranny are unchanged. Police officers are still shooting unarmed citizens. Bloated government agencies are still fleecing taxpayers. Government technicians are still spying on our communications. And American citizens are still allowing themselves to be manipulated by their fears and pitted one against the other. All of these themes can be found in the Twilight Zone. Serling, a truth teller who pulled no punches when it came to calling out the evils of his day, channeled his moral outrage into storytelling. As his daughter Anne explained, the Twilight Zone was more than just the strangest show on TV with the best theme song. But back in the 50s, Rod Serling was serving up social commentary through science fiction. That social commentary, disguised as entertainment, tackled some of the most pressing issues of Serling's day. It dealt with human issues, which I guess is why it's lasted so long, because it dealt with racism and mob mentality and scapegoating and things that are still very, very prevalent and relevant today, sadly. His daughter said, we don't seem to be able to move ahead and change. Ordinary people engage in those people, in, the, in those behaviors as well. Why is that very important? Because if people behaved in a way that is moral, right, instead of defining for themselves what is right and what is moral, you know, that moral relativism that so many people engage in. Well, I don't think I did anything by lying to you. So there, I'm going to take my, my, uh, my balls and go home. I'm going to take my toys and go home. I don't want to have anything to do with you. That's how a lot of adults behave. See, if we were unlike these greedy uh, CEOs and um, politicians and the sick psychopathic 
elitist nut jobs, if we were unlike them, then we would be standing up for what is right. We would have been outraged by all of the lies and all of the brutality and all of the wars and all of the taxes that government takes from you, stealing from you, demanding more and more. We would have manifested something different than what we are living. If we were able to take responsibility for our own mistakes, behaviors that we all know, we look, as adults, we all know the difference between right and wrong. But most adults act like children. They're not going to take responsibility for anything that they have done. They think it's better to protect their ego than be honorable, stand up, be accountable, work on themselves so that they don't behave in that way again, and genuinely apologize for hurting people they say they love. They don't behave that way. They'd rather scapegoat. They'd rather continue lying. Everything's about their ego, the self-centeredness. Much of it is very obvious. <clears throat> Some of it is insidious. That's why we're not able to move ahead. Because no one, well, I shouldn't say no one, few, we only have a few who really are capable of facing themselves in the mirror and doing the work necessary to change their behaviors. You have so many Christians who, well, we are all sinners. What does that mean? You get to sin and then just call yourself a Christian? Repent? What does repent mean? Most people think it just means genuinely apologizing to God, not taking in that other portion of, you know, hey, I've got to apologize to the people that I've hurt by my sins and then work on that behavior so I sin no more. And it's very clear in the Bible. Jesus says, sin no more. I will forgive you of your sins. Go and sin no more. And it is, it is just incredible to see how many Christians never really want to talk about that passage. Serling would have no shortage of material to draw from today. Given the government's greed for money and power, its disregard for human life, its corruption and graft, its pollution of the environment, its reliance on excessive force in order to ensure compliance, its covert activities, its illegal surveillance, and its blatant disdain for the rule of law. All of what I just read, much of that decades ago, that was not so obvious. The, six, the sickness had not become malignant. It hadn't, it hadn't, uh, it hadn't metastasized because we just continued on with our immoral behaviors. Now we're looking at metastatic malignant cancer. We're dying. We're dying. I can tell you, my dad, this is his daughter speaking, I can tell you my dad would be absolutely apoplectic about what's happening in the world today and deeply saddened. There are moments that I'm glad he's not here to see. It boggles the mind how relevant the Twilight Zone 
and its unique brand of truth-telling are to an age in which truth has become a convenient fiction for those in power. What researchers refer to as truth decay. We're living this now. Truth is gone. It's being it's being killed off. How could that have happened if the ordinary people didn't allow it to happen? There are so many people who don't want anybody to know the truth about their life. So they lie. You know, so much of this world, the problems of this world, would so quickly disappear if lying stopped. But just think about in this community of ours, if we had, if we had people who didn't lie, who were real, who weren't out, you know, to present as something that they're not, we would have a solid foundation. We would have so much support. We would be supporting one another and not isolated. And yes, it angers me because in my experience, the subscribers that I met, <laughs> lying is the thing. Lying. The lying that goes on. It's connected. Your, your personal relationships and how you behave in life, how you treat others in your own life, it's all connected. It's not separate. And if you do want if you want to change the world, my God, you have better be that change that you want to see. And then I think there's so many who have this, well, Trump is going to fix it. Jesus is coming back. He's going to fix it. Everybody is pointing to somebody else to fix it. Not everybody. A few understand we have no savior. We are. We are the savior we have been longing for. We are. You, me, the individual. And they, so many, I've gotten it through eight years. Don't worry, sit back. Jesus is coming. Well, you really understand how when people are brainwashed, boy, the evil, it's kind of like turning the world into their little playpen. When the majority of people are brainwashed, they can do whatever the hell they want. Truth decay. Truth decay is defined as a set of four related trends. Increasing disagreement about facts. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had this uh, woman who we were embarking on a friendship in Great Barrington. You know, those who have so much, have been given so much throughout life. You know, material wealth, education that mommy and daddy paid for. What have they done? You know, they all think they're spiritual or Christian, and they're all in exceedingly self-centered. Oh, I'm on that spiritual path. And it's all about 
their spiritual work is about doing things to make sure that they feel okay in life. It's all about them, how they feel. Oh my God, I'm anxious. I, I better go and, and go to some spiritual retreat that costs, you know, $2,000 for a day and a half so that I feel better. And they do feel better because there's so many like them and they all support one another. It's kind of like, you know, they get together and there are no real individuals there. It's like all me's. It's all me's. I'm sitting next to me and I'm sitting on the right. There's me and there's me in front of me and there's me in back of me. And I'll know I'll get support from me. I'll get support from my scam that I have deceived myself, deceiving myself into believing that I'm actually on a spiritual path. Yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. And if we don't do it, then then we are absolutely contributing, helping, helping these crazy people destroy life on this planet. When you get the connection, who? well, it's kind of painful but it sure does motivate you to do the work necessary to change that behavior. So, truth decay, increasing disagreement about facts. Oh, I meant to say, one of those friends actually said to me, well, Carol, a fact to you may not be a fact to somebody else. But these were people who were actually rewriting the dictionary. No joke. They were defining, defining for themselves words. So trying to have a conversation with them was maddening because they defined for themselves words and like what it meant. Um, as an example, AA meeting a meeting means you go to a location where a meeting is being held there's a structure and the meeting is generally an hour or an hour and a half and you meet up with other people who are sober uh, you there's an awful lot that goes on before and after you give service you know all that kind of stuff a meeting and I actually had people, not just one, there were two <laughs> who were defining for themselves what a meeting is. A phone call with another member of AA. A walk with me in the woods with my dogs was a meeting. And I, well, I was going out of my mind. I was like, uh, this is not a meeting. But, well, they got angry at me. Um, oh, I could give you a lot of examples. Yeah. Relativism. Moral relativism. Practical relativism. Um, behavioral relativism. Everything relativism. Communication relativism. Everything you get to define for your own self. And you never have to care about the effect you are having in the world because everything's about you. That's what we have become. So, yeah, um, a blurring of the line between opinion, opinion and fact, an increase in the relative volume and resulting influence of 
uh, opinion and personal experience of a fact and declining trust in formerly respected sources of factual information. Look, bottom line, <laughs> we've got truth decay. And it's up to every individual to make sure that they do not lie to others. They do not lie to themselves. They do not live a lie. They come out of it. And that's the only way that we will reestablish truth. That is the only way that we will reestablish meaningful relationships, trust in relationship, then in community. You know, it has a ripple effect. It goes out into the greater society when individuals in the aggregate are doing that work and behaving in ways that are right versus wrong. Sarah Ling would have a lot to say about the lies that masquerade as truth today. It's only because we have allowed it, we've engaged in it, we've helped manifest this. So I will link below to the rest of this article. Um, and he actually highlights some of the best shows, according to John Whitehead, that are relevant today. We need, we need to do the work necessary to try to get to our best, best self, to our best self. Oh, it's hard work. And it's also life. It's a lifetime job. Life is a serious thing. So if you're not taking it seriously, then you will only contribute to the misery, to the evil, to the destruction. It's your choice. It's your choice. And as I read in an article last night, choices have consequences. So we really do need to be very careful in what we choose. Ciao, guys.